Hello and uh, welcome to this York Festival uh, of Ideas event, Music in Peacebuilding. Uh, I'm Craig Robertson from the University of York and I'll be chairing this event. Um, and just a few technical notes before I introduce our speaker today and our panelists. If you are watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event. Uh, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have any technical issues, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again. Subtitles are available in this event. To turn these on or off, you can use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So our keynote will be delivered by Olivier Urban of the Minon Music Research Institute in Tokyo, Japan. And after that, uh, we'll be joined by our panelists, which include Laura Hassler, the Director of Musicians Without Borders, Darren Ferguson, the Director of Beyond Skin, and uh, from the University of York, we'll be joined by Jacob Erickson, lecturer in post-war recovery studies, uh, Henrika Altink, Professor of Modern History, Jonathan Ito, Senior Lecturer in Music, Rachel Calgill, Professor of Music and University Research Theme Champion for Creativity, and Paul Greedy, the director of the Center for Applied Human Rights. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Olivier. Welcome to our session on music in peace building. It's a great pleasure to meet you all on this occasion of the 10th anniversary of the York Festival of Ideas. I want to thank the organizers for their invitation and for all their support. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olivier Urbain, the director of the Min On Music Research Institute, and this is our office in Tokyo, Japan. Welcome. I would have really loved to meet you all uh, in the beautiful city of York, but with the COVID restrictions, uh, we have to meet online uh, via Zoom like this. So uh, diving directly into our topic of music in peace building, have you uh, used music at all uh, in the last year or, or a bit more during this pandemic? Have you used music at all to try to find solutions, to try to feel better about the situation, uh, to enhance your creativity, uh, to um, enhance your capacity to find ways to be creative, to connect more with people. Um, this is a very, very tough situation for everybody. So um, I would like to give you an example of how uh, a friend and, and myself have used music during this pandemic. This friend is from Africa, but he lives in another country in Asia. 
and he lives there, he works there, he has his family there. And I wanted to visit him, it's not really far, but it's impossible with this pandemic. And a few months ago, something really terrible happened to him. He lost his job, he might have to leave the country, he might be separated from his family. And I want to go and talk to him, but of course I can't. Fortunately, he's a musician. So to express the depth of his suffering, he uh, created a song. It's actually a multi-track masterpiece, just fantastic. And he sent it to me. And uh, by hearing, connecting with the music, I could really understand the depth of his suffering and his desire to overcome at the same time. And that is really a, a positive aspect of this terrible situation because we can really connect and then we can continue our discussions. And I, I don't have to ask each time, how are you doing today? Are you okay? Are you coping? I kind of know because I can connect through his music. So that is uh, one example. Everything else becomes easier once we connect deeply through the music. So along the same lines, I wonder if uh, you have an example of a song that has touched you, that has changed your life, or that is important to you because of the occasion. You heard it, or you played it, you sung it. And um, well, in my case, that there's one song that really changed uh, a lot for me. Uh, I was uh, a, a little kid, I was nine or 10, and uh, my parents came back from shopping, all excited, didn't know why. They go to the room where there was um, this old machine that plays uh, vinyl records, and they play this incredible heavenly song. I never heard anything like this, and I was really uh, touched to the core. I still remember the feeling. So I I went to ask them, what, what is this? I never heard something like, this is fantastic, this is fabulous. I love the, the singers, I wanna be their friend. Who are they? And then they showed me um, the, the jacket of um, Edwin Hawkins singers, Oh Happy Day. Oh Happy Day um, was originally a hymn. It was arranged as a gospel by Edwin Hawkins and it became an international hit in 1969. So now you know my age. Um, so for me, that was very, very important because those people became my friends before I could see their picture. And I was raised in a totally white middle-class family, village, town, province. And um, okay, sure, okay, they, they have black skin, but it didn't matter to me because their voices were so wonderful and I wanted to be their friends anyway. So I immediately thought, oh, okay, there are people who are white and black and other, all kinds of colors and we have to hear their voices first. That's how we can connect. Um, so, oh, happy day uh, still gives me goosebumps today. And uh, in a way, it was a really uplifting educational experience. Um, and I think that's what uh, music therapy does. Uh, music therapy has been um, happening uh, since uh, at least the Second World War, I mean, in, in, in the West and in, in the world. I'm sure, I'm sure people have used music 70,000 years ago when we were uh, roaming the plains. But as far as uh, official music therapy that we know today, you know, it started kind of after the Second World War. And it shows fantastic results for individuals, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients do feel much better when music therapy is done properly. So it works for individuals, we know that. And it works for small groups too. Like, you know, two or three people need to reconnect or forgive, or you can organize a very good uh, session. There is, of course, now community music therapy that works very well too. So where, where does it stop, right? So let's go back. Individual, if it's done well, and if the person can connect to music, it can work like 100%, like fantastic. For small groups, yeah, can work. As the groups go larger, the effect of music drops and kind of stops. So where exactly does it stop? Is there a magic number? 
um, and why does it stop? So um, this question is basically what has been um, motivated me to do everything that I'm doing. And I'd like to read a passage from, from a book. So this book is Music and Conflict Transformation. It was the first academic book on music and peace building published in 2008. It was re-edited uh, in 2015 with a, a foreword by the man considered one of the top, maybe the top jazz composer and saxophone player in the world, Wayne Shorter. So Wayne Shorter wrote a foreword and I quote, on another occasion, a young person shared with me that while suffering from despondency and lack of hope, seriously thinking about committing suicide, it was due to hearing, it was due to hearing the song Speak No Evil, which I had written in the 60s, that he changed his mind and decided to go beyond his circumstances to aim higher and go further. I heard these kinds of stories many times. And I have no doubt concerning the power of music to heal people's hearts, no matter how badly wounded. In a way, for all these years, together with all kinds of wonderful people, I have been very much involved in trying to push the boundaries towards social music therapy, a phrase I found in the introduction of this book. So Wayne Shorter quotes the introduction of this book, and he uses the phrase, social music therapy. That, that's all, that's the entire program of our institute. According to me, um, we, we start with what music therapy actually does and try to push the boundaries. Can we heal entire communities, societies, countries, continents, the whole of humanity? Well, we know that the effect stops at some point, but research question for all the students looking for a topic, where does it stop and why does it stop? Now, everything I've said so far uh, make it sound, makes it sound like uh, music has some wonderful power and it's always for good, it's always for happiness and therapy and, and connection. Well, no, it's not. It's not. I want to be very clear about this. Um, this what I want to talk about now is the ambivalence of music, the ambivalence. It can do really good things and it can make you do terrible things too. By the way, it's not music that does anything, it's people inspired by music that do things. That, I, I think you know that anyway. Ambivalence of music. So this has to do with creativity and its social applications. We want to apply uh, the potential of music in social um, circumstances and social activities but we have to be aware that it can be used for terrible things, it can be used for torture, it can be used to, to kill people, to distract them. And uh, a very famous example of the uh, ambivalence of music uh, is what happened in, uh, in Rwanda. So uh, Simon Bikindi was a really famous singer and, and dancer, very, very popular in Rwanda, somehow uh, right the years leading up to 94, 1994, he decided to write songs to attack one of the groups in Rwanda and incite another group to attack them and, and kill them. Those songs were unfortunately very, very popular. And uh, he definitely incited a lot of violence with his songs. But then in the same country of Rwanda, 10 years later, in 2004, a woman established Ingoma and Shia, which is a drumming group for women. And um, all women from all sides of the civil war came together, forgave each other reconciliation through music, through drumming, and also empowerment of women who, are, who at that time were not really supposed to play music in, in, in Africa, not the drums at least. So um, there's a, a famous movie called Sweet Dreams about uh, their uh, amazing success story. So same country, same type of music, two completely different ways to use uh, music. So is that good news or bad news for uh, the 
art and science of music in peace building. The fact that music can be used for wonderful things and for terrible things with equal effectiveness. Well, um, I would say um, it's kind of good news because it means it has tremendous impact potentially. And if we choose to do good, we choose to feel good about ourselves, feel good with others, to connect, to improve society, make things better. If that's our choice, then we can use music and its tremendous power, even if it's ambivalent, we can use it for good, it's a choice. So um, why peace building and why not peace? Uh, well, uh, as we know, um, Almost everybody has their, their, we all have our definition of peace. What does peace mean to you? Oh, we have all kinds of, you know, peace with justice or peace with authority, or I mean, there's all kinds. So peace is kind of like a lighthouse. It's your a dream that you want to move forward. This is how I see society. This is my dream. I want to move in that direction. But we are on a ship right now and there's a storm. So we, we, you know, orient ourselves thanks to the lighthouse, but we don't want to crash in the rocks. We just use the lighthouse. The real journey is peace building, is the doing of it. So that's why we use the word peace building and we analyze, we study how music is applied in peace building situations. So uh, one obvious example of uh, music in peace building is how music can be used to uh, enhance the effectiveness of, of human rights. And our institute uh, organized an exhibition in 2018 uh, called Music and Human Rights. And there were lots of panels and a lot of recordings people could put, put on headphones and everything. And I just want to mention the, the most obvious one. I think anybody interested in music and human rights uh, knows about this, but just want to uh, confirm that uh, during the March on Washington in 1963, that's the march where uh, Dr. King um, at the Lincoln Memorial uh, delivered his, his amazing speech, uh, I have a dream. So that the same event about from 200,000 to 300,000 people, let's say 250,000 people, a young girl um, starts singing a song or all by herself on stage, and she really moved the, those hundreds of thousands of people. And she sang uh, We Shall Overcome, which by the way is another hymn that was uh, adapted to a, arranged as a gospel again. So um, very famous lyrics are in, in, in that song are, Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. So I'd like to give examples of um, organizations that uh, have chosen to do good and who are, they are using the, the potential of music to create uh, a better world, better societies, better communities. I've just mentioned two of them that there's so many. Uh, one of them is Musicians Without Borders. Um, that's a very good name when you think about it. You know, you have Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières and Musicians Without Borders. And their motto is War Divides, Music Connects. That is so deep. That is very, very deep. War Divides, Music Connects. Why is it deep? Because... Um, there are some theories of global governance, international relations, big words, that show that basically there are two types of governance. Some leaders, and I'm sure some names will come to your mind, love to govern by dividing. They want to they divide people, they create superiors and inferiors, they insult some groups, they pamper other groups, make sure people fight with each other so they can keep their power. That's one way of doing it. Others, they work through connection. They are the co-creators. They want to be a facilitator of this energy flow that we can all you know, take part in to organize ourselves, to share resources, to organize societies. Those are the co-creators. So basically we can divide the styles of leadership in two ways. Uh, 
either you, you rule by control, which implies division, or you rule by co-creation, which implies unity. So war divides, that's what you do if you want to control. Music connects, that's what you do if you want people to, to get together. And I'd like to quote uh, from their website um, one um, declaration by Jimi Hendrix, one of the top guitar players ever in the history of humankind. Uh, quote, um, if there is something to be changed in this world, then it can only happen through music, unquote. Um, Another quote on their website from Nelson Mandela. You may be poor, you may only have a ramshackle house, you may have lost your job, but that song gives you hope, unquote. That song, of course, is, is your song. You, you choose which song he's talking about. So that's uh, Musicians uh, Without Border. Um, feel free to check their website. Another organization is called uh, Beyond Skin, and uh, they are based in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, and their slogan is, I mean, one of the, the slogans is, we are beyond skin, we make a difference. That is also very, very deep, um, because we make differences between us and others based on all kinds of um, superficial um, characteristics. For example, skin color or gender or apparent gender or the way you dress or how much money it looks like you have in the bank account. Um, so we, we constantly do that. Our brain does that automatically. We create separations and differences. Beyond skin means you look beyond all that and even beyond the skin to the heart. Beyond skin means everybody has the same uh, overall set of skills to deal with life. Uh, I think most people on this planet can feel anger and sadness and fear and joy in different ways with different circumstances, but I think it's, it's pretty, we have that in common. So, if we look at that beyond skin, we can make a difference against all our differences. And they, on their website, they talk about security in diversity. I'm just gonna read, I think it's, it's a really um, coherent and very uh, focused uh, declaration here on their website. They consider themselves as creative innovators in peace building, quote, enabling the arts as the dialogue to assist the development of a more peaceful, equal and intercultural society free from racism and sectarianism, sectarianism unquote. So that's Beyond Skin. And actually we, we've been working with them for about two years now. And we produced a, a music video that was almost entirely created by young people by high school uh, students in, uh, in Northern Ireland. It's the Glen Gormley High School and uh, they wrote the lyrics. And in Japan, it's the, um, the CNS, two letters, CS, CNS uh, Music School. And they, they wrote the, the song, the melody, the chords, and uh, it's available on YouTube. The song is called Far Away, It's Free, you're welcome to see um, what kind of uh, work we do together with uh, Beyond Skin. So finally, um, I'd like to say something about uh, the future of music in peace building, of course, the imagined future of music in peace building. So we are in the middle of a, of a pandemic and uh, it doesn't seem to go away. Um, so we want it to stop. We all want this to stop, absolutely. But it's not stopping right now. So uh, I think the best way to cope with this is to take action while it continues. Uh, for instance, in, in Japan, I, I teach classes in a mode that's called high flex. They call it high flex. It means you are fully ready to teach online 100%. Everything's super ready online, but the classrooms are reserved too at the same time. 
and then you can you can mix both. Uh, it, it's kind of complicated, but um, I'm saying this because um, our institute has decided to really uh, focus and invest in in online uh, sharing uh, for the next two years. But that doesn't mean we don't, don't have hope the pandemic is not going to stop or we don't want it to stop. We do want it to stop like everybody else. But when you think about it, we were already, we the people, using uh, a lot of online technology before the pandemic. So this is an opportunity to focus on this, do it right. And then if we can meet again and hug again and dance and sing together again in the same room, let's do that. But we do have, in addition, wonderful online tools if we develop them. So that's what we're going to do for the next uh, two years. What I'm really interested in is that even if it's all virtual, if there is music involved, then we get a real emotional experience, a real emotional experience. So if anybody is interested in, in this high-tech uh, stuff of which I, you know, I, I'm totally lost here, uh, please let us know. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Olivier. Um, and we're going to hear some individual responses from all of our panelists uh, first, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to a general discussion. But just before we continue, I'm just going to read out a couple of things that came in the Q&A. And it really highlights the ambivalence uh, of music, as Olivier mentioned. So the first uh, comment from somebody who wanted to mention John Lennon's song, Imagine, uh, as the ultimate peace building song. Uh, and then there was a response uh, from somebody else pointing out that the Beatles White Album was apparently the inspiration for Charles Manson and his activities. So there you go. A uh, perfect uh, example there uh, of the ambivalence of music and, and how it can be used by different people for different purposes. Um, but before we go into the general discussion, we'll first hear from Laura Hassler from Musicians Without Borders. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Olivier. Um, thanks to everyone for including me and Musicians Without Borders in this um, online conference today. Um, I'd like to uh, respond to a couple of threads of Olivier's talk and starting indeed with the question of the ambivalence of music as he um, called it. I would think of it more as, uh, or I always have thought of it more as the, the power of music to connect people obviously can be used to connect people across divides, but can also be used to connect people in one group um, against others. And um, for that reason, in Musicians Without Borders, working around the world with people and in regions that have been impacted by war and armed conflict, especially, um, we look to a body of thought and principles as a kind of a, a check, or you could say a conscience on our work. And those are the principles of active nonviolence um, as, uh, as spoken, uh, taught and, and um, used, modeled by such people as Martin Luther King. Um, and that, to us, that is, that is a way of kind of checking back. We also incorporated in a number of our trainings around the world where appropriate these values, which include do no harm, stand with people who have suffered, do not attack the person, but rather, rather oppose um, the, the, the wrong acts or, or destructive behavior. So nonviolence has become a kind of conscience in our work. And um, that brings me also to Olivier's story of the March in Washington, 1963, of Joan Baez um, singing We Shall Overcome. For me, it's a very personal story because I was actually there as a 15-year-old um, budding activist, and it was a life-changing, life-determining event for me in so many ways. Um, and uh, to me, the, also the question of how we position ourselves in the world as people and organizations that are, um, that are applying the power of music to peace building and social change. Again, um, two interesting phrases from Martin Luther King 
can provide some kinds of wisdom in that, to me anyway. One of them, uh, he spoke about the fierce urgency of now, uh, the fierce urgency of now, which I think all of us are feeling, um, including the pandemic, but also the, the many global issues of injustice and suffering around the world. But the other phrase is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And these two phrases that seem to be somewhat contradictory, I think really can provide some guidelines to both um, following the process, being true to the values that we talk about at every level of our organization and our work, and also having the patience to see um, the long arc. And that's particularly appropriate now in this time when we're all called upon, I think, to be patient with, um, with the general situation. And I just end with a little anecdote also related to that very same day on uh, August 28th, 1963. And another singer, another musician who really had a huge impact on that day was Mahalia Jackson, who was known as the queen of the gospels. It was a very dear friend of Martin Luther King. And the story is that King was reading his prepared remarks in his speech, he was speaking, she leaned over to him and she whispered in his ear, tell them about the dream, Hart, tell them about the dream. So there you have music, a musician um, changing the course of history in so many ways. Thank you so much for this opportunity to respond and I look forward to hearing other people's remarks. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay, well now, now hear from Darren Ferguson from Beyond Skin. Hello everybody. Um, delighted to be here, be part of this. Um, I'm going to take it at a kind of different angle as well, and looking at more of the blurred line between music and sound. And I'm, I'm a big music fan, and uh, it's quite diverse as well. Uh, but I remember hearing in the eighties um, a song, or if you want to call it a song, or composition by um, electronic group, The Art of Noise, close to the edit, which starts with um, the sample of a Volkswagen Golf being played on a keyboard as musical notes. And, you know, that was, that was a big moment for me because I realized that music could be, be more diverse than what I thought it was. And I suppose when we're looking at music and peace building, it's looking at how we humans function at our very best and relate to music and sound. I mean, generally we function our best around music, art, dance, green spaces, food and drink. That's where we're really good and things happen. Uh, and music is a big part of that not just the music sounds we're familiar with or the songs we like, but our environmental sounds. I mean, as I was speaking to you here, I can hear the buzz of my fridge, which is not really different from some Brian Eno songs which exist in the, in the sphere. Uh, so music like art is very subjective. You know, it has a purpose and it has no purpose. And sometimes it's for the, the sense of the moment and your connection with yourself and connection with your, 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 your neighbours, your global neighbours and your fellow humans around the world. So I suppose when we're looking at peace building, we're looking at how music impacts people. It triggers our emotions. It's a chemical reaction happens in our brain as well. And a good friend of mine, um, Mark Smillian, who did amazing stuff, uh, especially in Israel and Palestine, bringing young people together through music. And he's been studying a lot about neuroscience and how music affects the brain. I mean, he, he told me that music does not assist dialogue. He told me that music is a dialogue. And that's something which, which stuck with me because I think that's so key of how we relate to environmental sound and music all the time in, in terms of us gathering great awareness about each other and the understanding uh, of, of each other. And at the core of peace building, there's relationships. That's at the core of, of peace building, trust and relationships. So it's how music enables that and, and, and enables that discussion. And look at happenings. We've done a lot of stuff we call happenings where you just get a space and you put people in there with no agenda, but music is an artist. Are you playing music, listening to music, or just enjoying that space with others with music somewhere in the sphere or sound? And that's where relationships and conversations naturally happen rather than conversations which are kind of forced or dictated to. And I think music can play a big role in that. And I think the peace building sector also has to look at popular culture. If you look on YouTube, a lot of the, the kind of social um, videos on, on YouTube about making the world you know, a better place 
you know, some have 8 million hits, but then some pop songs have 80 million hits. And then the crazy thing is, there's a cat in the bath, and, and 80 million people have watched that as well. So what what attracts people visually and um, to something like that, and, and the sound as well? I think we've really got to look at popular culture, and uh, we've been using a, a term, which is probably not very popular in its current times, but it's about making peace infectious, making peace contagious, and music is a great way of doing that, of bringing people together, galvanizing stuff, and challenging people as well, and take them out of their comfort zone, but in a safe way, because as David Bowie says, uh, if you're a musician in a safe space, you're in the wrong space. So it's looking at that kind of clash between safe spaces to work with people and to, to get to deal with things and get through things. We're all trying to deal with human beings and our differences and those conflicts, but also to push people gently outside their comfort zone into a creative space as well to learn something. So I hope that's some use to you. Um, thank you much for your time. Uh, I'll hand it back to Craig now. Thanks very much, Darren. And now we'll hear from Henrika Altink, Professor of Modern History at the University of York and the co-director of the Interdisciplinary Global Development Center. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, so I think like, like the previous two people and also some of the comments in, in, um, in the chat function as well, uh, I was really struck by the idea of the ambivalence of music and because it also really resonates well with my own work. So as Craig said, I'm a modern historian, but I work on the island of Jamaica in the post-war period. Jamaica has a very strong culture of political partisanship. There's two parties and they've been rivaling. So each party having gangs, and um, at times this rivalry between the two parties has created an almost civil war-like um, situation. And this was particularly the case in the 1970s. During the 1972 elections, um, one of the two main parties started to use reggae music in its uh, campaign. Um, it used even you know, hired artists to, to write specific songs for that campaign. And then four years later at the next election, the other party also realized, you know, actually it's a really good tool, also started to use reggae. But in, you know, the intervening years and, you know, between these two elections, the, the fighting between these two parties and their factions uh, increased. Um, and um, in 1978 in April, um, a big concert was held called the One Love Peace Con Concert. And one of the main artists at that, at that concert was Bob Marley. And I'm gonna share my screen and show you um, um, an image um, which probably many of you um, will have seen. And that is Bob Marley holding the hands of on the left, um, um, Michael Manley from the PMP party. And then on the right, Edward Ziaga of the Jamaica Labour Party. This particular concert came about in, in quite an ironic way, actually, because two of the gangsters, each associated with, two, with the two different parties, had met in prison and decided that actually what would be useful is to have a concert that would bring people together as a way of uniting the, the, the country. And it was, you know, at the time, a really important concert. But then going back to the idea of ambivalence, if you go two years forward in time to 1980, the two gangsters who had organized the concert had died, they'd been killed. And then in 1980, during the election, 900 people were killed. So, so the impact of that con concert, we, we, can, we can think about that, especially in, in contrast to the war, march on Washington. And this also made me realize, you know, when Oliver started his talk, he said, you know, music um, and, and in terms of, you know, therapy can work at the individual level, it might work at, at the kind of group level, but, but beyond that, its impact diminishes. So, so very much my question is then, you know, how well does it work at the country level and especially in, in developing um, countries context? And then Oliver's talk also made me wonder about how inclusive um, music is as a tool of peace building. So certain types of music uh, may alienate certain ages or certain classes. And then I also was wondering whether music as, as kind of peace building tool may not work maybe in some societies because in some societies, music may simply not be a very important thing. 
whereas in other societies it may be quite an important thing. So these were just a couple of thoughts I had on the basis of, of my own work uh, on 1970s Jamaica and, and about uh, developing uh, countries more generally. So thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Um, and next we'll hear from Rachel Calgill, Professor of Music at the University of York and Research Theme Champion for Creativity. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you, Olivier, for such a fantastic talk. And in terms of my own uh, work in uh, the sort of history of music's engagement and uh, presence within peacemaking processes, I just wanted to give an example, which I think also gives um, some idea of the sort of ambivalent place that music has in peace building and can have in peace building processes. Um, so I wanted to talk about this work, uh, John Fold and Maud McCarthy's A World Requiem, partly because a hundred years ago this year, um, this work was completed by the British cellist and composer John Folds and his partner, the violinist Maud McCarthy, and their intention was to produce an extraordinary monumental commemorative or oratorio, a world requiem, which was for vocal soloists, as you can see here, this is the British Library score, a uh, chorus of boys and youths, a full chorus orchestra and organ, in other words, a cast of thousands. Um, it was written as, quote, a tribute to the memory of the dead and a message of consolation to the bereaved of all countries. So stated explicitly this idea of music being able to enact a process of reconciliation and peace building. It was originally dedicated to the uh, YMCA and Folds and McCarthy had in fact both been involved in providing music uh, for soldiers in London during the latter stages of the First World War. And these documents that I'm showing here are actually from a substantial archive of Folds and McCarthy uh, that's held here at the Borthwick Institute at the University of York. And this gives you the sort of uh, example of the work they were doing with soldiers in providing uh, a very broad European mix of classical music, all of which sacred in tone, but not specific in doctrine. Um, they, uh, continued under the auspices of the, RM, of the YMCA to work with uh, young soldiers in London after the First World War and Folds actually became musical director of the National Council of the YMCA's uh, during the time he was writing this piece. And the libretto that McCarthy put together for the piece, so the words, as you can see there, um, reflected the um, ideas and the intentions of the composer. She pieced together biblical passages from the Psalms and Gospels, the book of Revelation, but also mixed in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which was one of the most popular books for certainly British troops to take out when fighting at the front in, and to have in their pockets um, during their time at the front. But also reflecting their interest in theosophy and in studies of Indian music and Eastern mysticism, there were also passages from the 15th century poet Kabir, all mixed in and McCarthy wrote some connecting text of her own to bring it all together smoothly. Now, I would love to play you some of this music, but time doesn't permit just to say it is available on a recording by Chandos. Uh, a live recording was made in 2007 and you can uh, hear that. You can get that hold of that very easily. Suffice it to say for our purposes, that what's very interesting about this piece is the context in which it was first heard. It was performed as the first of the British legions, the embryonic British legions, uh, festivals of Re remembrance, the very first of those that was done in the Albert Hall in 1923. And it was performed over four years. Um, and as you can see, the uh, marketing, the sort of uh, the ephemera around these performances, stress, the connection with the British Legion, the size, the idea of reconciliation coming through, the sheer numbers of people coming together to use this work for commemoration and for grief. Um, and there's a performance image from the very last performance of 1926 to give you a sense of the sheer scale of this collective act of music making. So what I think is particularly interesting about this is what happens in the course of those four performances over four years, because it allows us to track um, the dynamics of grief and commemorative uh, remembrance uh, in Britain during the first uh, four years of this work's existence, which coincided with the uh, early years of the post-war period, 21 um, through to 23 to 26. 
So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of that. This was at the time when veterans associations are being formed all over the world. They are, are asserting themselves in the idea of a shared uh, experience of terrible conflict and crisis in war. Um, and they're assuming a role in reconstruction and in post-war diplomacy. And as you can see here, Earl Haig and the British uh, Legion are really backing the British Legion, sorry, the, 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 the World Requiem as a, an opportunity to bring people together and to speak to and um, uh, care for uh, those who were bereaved, but also those who'd been through the conflict um, as uh, combatants. So um, Haig's vision, as you can see, uh, was to use these performances to gather together political powers, representatives from different governments and veterans associations. And this happened particularly in 24. His own view was very much uh, an internationalism based though on empire, as you can see there. And he spoke very much in terms of uh, not only bringing the empire uh, veterans associations together, but also using them to create an imperial church uh, that brought the different uh, religions together. These are sort of things that he spoke about when he was unveiling war memorials in different parts um, of the, the country. Uh, and was soon asked to kind of take the stress off that particular message um, for reasons I can't go into here. So it was an internationalist vision. And at the 25 production, um, the, uh, sorry, 25 performance, uh, there was an, uh, a move to bring veterans associations or representatives of those to the performance from former enemy nations. So this was an act of diplomacy taking place in the context of the performance of this extraordinary work. As it happened, the American representative would not shake hands with uh, one of the members of the former uh, enemy um, veterans associations. Um, and so the uh, character of that performance then for the British Legion became one very much, up, uh, very much wrapped up with this experience of great anticipation and then uh, loss and disappointment over a missed opportunity. Um, other reasons why the work uh, started to fall out of favour and then by 26 it was in its last iteration at the Albert Hall were to do with jealousy on the part of church musicians. John Folds was not a professional church musician, he hadn't been professionally trained, so there was a sense of who is getting to speak in musical terms for the whole nation on Remembrance Day and what emerged as Remembrance Day um, and how did they speak a unifying language when they've not been professionally trained. Um, church musicians very much reacting in that way and starting to move against the work. Within the Church of England, as, it's, as you can see here, there was also some protests coming through that these performances were taking place in sacred places, but they didn't fit with ideas of what was acceptable in terms of the sacred texts that were being performed. So it became a deeply problematic piece but one, as you track it through the four years in its reception, I think, articulates an awful lot of really interesting cultural and political and musical dynamics, which we know very little about. This work itself dropped completely out of the repertoire. It's unknown, except for this re recording that was put together in 2007 and the work that's been done by musicologists such as myself and others um, in looking at it in the context of its time. So um, it's really just speaking from a historical perspective to some of the themes there that Olivier opened up with such aplomb in his presentation. I will leave it there. Much more to be said. I will leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Rachel. Um, just moving on, we're going to hear from Jacob Erickson now, who's a lecturer in post-war recovery studies uh, here at York. Thanks, Craig. Um, so my work uh, is broadly on peace building um, and specifically peace building in what we sometimes refer to as uh, identity based conflicts. So I tend to do a lot of work on cases like the Israeli Palestinian conflict, uh, conflict in Iraq, um, but I've also done field work in places like Kosovo um, and Sri Lanka. And one of the things that uh, I guess I've seen across a number of these different cases is how the arts and often music specifically um, can offer uh, an alternative identity uh, to help create connections between people, to transcend political divides, uh, to promote peaceful coexistence and reconciliation between people. The idea being that you offer an alternative identity marker through something like music 
um, that can help bring people together rather than divide. And I think this is a really fascinating kind of element of, of human relationships. And we see it in a couple of different examples from these contexts. So we have um, a, a collaboration between uh, the conductor Daniel Barenboim and uh, the late uh, Palestinian academic Edward Said, who put together the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, bringing together Israeli musicians, Palestinian musicians, and other musicians from the Arab world. Uh, and myself, I've also seen firsthand through fieldwork in uh, Jerusalem, where we have music sessions between young Israelis and Palestinians to help um, you know, bring people together in these people-to-people -people activities. Similarly, in the case of uh, conflict in Kosovo, uh, there's a project that I believe was started by Musicians Without Borders uh, called Mitrovica Rock School, um, which has always been very, very heavily praised by um, you know, the various interlocutors I've spoken to in Kosovo as a civil society peace building project. So it's clear that we have these great examples of relationship building through music. Um, but I think Olivier's question here about how to scale up these activities is in a sense a really, really important one and, and perhaps the most difficult one. Um, how do you scale up these individual relationships? Um, and I guess I've always thought of uh, music and peace building activities as the important thing being the physical bringing together of people, the establishment of the shared identity. But of course, that is only going to apply to people who are actually in the room. And through the course of uh, our event today, I've been thinking more and more that perhaps it is the music itself that is the key to this. Um, and that, that the actual output from a kind of shared music activity um, is potentially the way to think about rallying people around uh, something and scaling up this activity. Um, and, and it struck me in part because of something that else is going on right now, which is, of course, um, the, the European Championships in, in football, the Euros. Um, I've always loved uh, hearing the national anthems. Um, I've always enjoyed them. I've always found uh, many of them very, very moving. Um, and it's interesting how you can have a piece of music that, uh, you know, kind of brings uh, people, you know, from a particular country together. Uh, and it made me think more and more that maybe some type of shared identification with uh, a jointly created musical output uh, can potentially help do this. Um, of course, there's no accounting for, for taste, um, but nonetheless, perhaps, um, yeah, we should think not just in terms of the physical bringing together, uh, but also the usefulness of the actual output itself. Um, you know, what Olivier was talking about in terms of music therapy. Um, so I thought that that was uh, a really, really interesting thing that, that I'll certainly take away from, from this session. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jonathan Ito, a senior lecturer in music, again at York. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, Olivier, for, for the presentation. Uh, my research interests are, are largely around jazz music, specifically jazz music in South Africa. So I was especially delighted to to see uh, for the first time that, that quote from, from Wayne Shorter in, in, in um, Olivier's presentation, um, opening up the idea of, of social music therapy and the question of, can we heal through music? Um, I'd also uh, uh, like to turn things uh, specifically to South Africa, uh, because apart from anything, that's where my research interests are and acknowledge that uh, yesterday, uh, June the 16th, uh, was Youth Day in South Africa, which is a public holiday that celebrates or commemorates, I should say, um, the, the Soweto uprising, uh, which, as you may know, was the, uh, the peaceful protest of school children in 1976, um, who were then uh, gunned down by um, the apartheid government. Um, I'd like to also uh, try and uh, think through um, this relationship between uh, peace building and music and conflict that several people have touched on. Um, um, and in order to do that, think about how music um, and peace building relate to other stations on the journey to peace. Um, so perhaps music as protest, how does music function as protest? 
uh, music and human rights. And uh, certainly in the case of South Africa, music and reparation, um, because without meaningful reparation, uh, we might ask how do younger generations uh, go forward with hope? Um, and that's especially relevant, I think, in the South African context where a lot of uh, younger people feel perhaps uh, sold a little short by the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission uh, that was put into place after the first democratic elections. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, their, their question being, what's changed? Uh, the, the, the power structures are still in place. Um, and as someone interested in music, I'm, I'm very concerned about how this can be of music uh, rather than music about um, peace building, if, if, if that makes sense. So to, to think about some, uh, or to share some uh, examples from musicians I've had the pleasure of working with in South Africa um, to illustrate uh, these ideas and perhaps this journey from, from conflict to peace through music. Um, I'm thinking about a song called Itemba by Nduduza Makatini, who's a jazz pianist and composer. Itemba uh, translates from Sizulu as hope. And if you Google Itemba Nduduza Makatini on YouTube, you'll see a video that he's put up um, from the recording. It was actually made at the University of York, or part of it was. Um, and it's bookended by the very famous um, photograph of, of Hector Peterson um, dying off in the arms of, uh, of, of a man carrying him um, after the shootings uh, as part of the um, government's response to the Sweater Uprising. So there's this idea that hope, a letter of, a musical letter of hope to the younger generations, um, Itemba, um, is, is uh, in a sense commemorating and remembering back to these, these terrible events um, that happened. Um, I think it's also perhaps relevant to say that uh, Itemba, the song, uh, was composed for an ensemble that Duduza Makatini calls Ikambi. Ikambi uh, translates from the Sisulu uh, as healing uh, and it's music through healing and he would regard himself rather than a musician, but a Sangoma or a traditional healer. Um, and you may or may not know there's a there's a there's a Kosa idiom, Apokokona uh, Ikkokona in Goma, uh, which roughly translates as where there's a healer, there must be a song. So there's this absolutely fundamental uh, link, uh, both in terms of cultural practice. Uh, uh, and in, in the language itself uh, between music and healing in the, in the uh, work of Dudruza Makatini. And indeed, um, he's offering um, prayers of hope and ways of looking forward, but nevertheless um, acknowledge um, the great sacrifices made by uh, uh, people fighting against apartheid. Um, and implicitly asking um, you know, how, how we go forward when perhaps um, there hasn't been um, reparation. Um, there's, there's many other examples I could give, but I think uh, due to the three minutes, I'll, I'll leave it there and hand back over to, to Craig. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Professor Paul Greedy, the Director of the Centre for Applied Human Rights at the University of York. Thank you, Craig. Um, my thanks to Craig and Olivia, Olivia as well, for a very interesting presentation and to the panelists. Um, my work has uh, historically been on transitional justice, which is looking at how countries emerging from conflict and authoritarian rule deal with the past through mechanisms like truth commissions, trials, and so on. In South Africa, Rwanda, Tunisia, and elsewhere. My first set of points really about, more generally about the role that culture can play in transitions and in relation to transitional justice interventions. I do want to recognize a tension that Jonathan raised about the instrument instrumentalization of culture 
which many cultural practitioners that I, I know are kind of uncomfortable with, but there are a range of roles that for me, culture played within the transition in South Africa, which are very important. And I'll cover them briefly. The first was to question the idea of a master narrative around history. Do we need to replace the apartheid era history with another singular history created by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Do we need multiple histories as well as multiple voices? But then on the other side of that equation, if you like, do we want a situation where all of these are seen to be equal that collapses into relativism, transitional justice, seeks to privilege the voice and histories of victims and survivors. So culture was very much part of that debate, seeking to open certainly the idea of history beyond a singular history. A second key area where I think it contributed was what's often called the unfinished business of transitional justice or peace building. So the things that the official interventions can't achieve and culture played a very important role here, sometimes in dealing with highly sensitive political issues like spying, informing, betrayal, but also, as again, Jonathan mentioned, this idea of reparations, that would be another example. And finally, the point that Olivia made about peace building being a journey is a very important one. Many countries where peace building takes place are maybe not at, uh, at war, maybe not fully author authoritarian governments, but neither are they democracies and at peace. They're in a gray zone in between where freedom of expression may still be um, highly contested. And in such contexts, culture and music can communicate in ways in which other forms of expression can't, often communicating through ambiguity, metaphor, irony, um, multiple meanings uh, that can be attached to cultural outputs. It can, it can work below the radar, if you like, of um, the established forms of, of oppression and constraint. Two final quick points that I, I want to make then. One is, and it's been alluded to by a number of speakers, that music is a way of bringing youth back into peace building. And peace building young people are often seen as being part of the problem, being the source of violence. And as a result, they're often marginalized during peace building. Music is one way of reintegrating young people and young voices into, into peace building. But it's also, and this again is something that as I've mentioned, there is a danger that it accentuates uh, intergenerational divides, certainly in relation to uh, the Arab revolutions, hip hop and rap were very significant, but for a particular generation in a way that may have marginalized older generations. And my final point is on music and what I call the material dimensions of peace building. A lot of the discussion we've had about music relates to things like emotions, healing, reconciliation, which are clearly very significant. But certainly in my work and practice, the material elements of peace building, economic issues, livelihoods, power dynamics and challenging power dynamics are also really significant. And I guess my question here is, can music play a role there? Or is music uh, really something that we need to think about in relation to those other issues, which are significant? Um, emotions, healing, and so on, but perhaps don't directly address some of the more material elements of peace building. I'll end there, Craig, and um, hand back to you. Thank you all very much. Great. Well, thanks very much to, to all the panelists uh, so far. <clears throat> what I'm going to do first is I'm, try I'm going to try to uh, summarize some of the comments and questions that are happening in the Q&A and some of the questions that were raised by the panelists. And once I summarize all of that, I'll uh, leave it to all of our participants to uh, decide how they want to respond um, to any all or something else that has, has occurred to them. Um, so starting with some of the things that are going on in the Q&A, uh, there's a question about how to move beyond uh, trauma or bad memories that they might associate with a certain type of music. Uh, so, in other words, is perhaps is, is that type of music or song completely ruined uh, as a potential peace building element if they already associate it strongly with, with bad memories? Another uh, aspect is wanting to hear more about dialogue rather than the, just the healing aspect. Um, although I do believe uh, Darren um, talked quite a lot about that in his, in his uh, uh, section. Um, 
And then there's a number of really, really interesting comments uh, about different contexts and how music uh, has been used uh, in um, Le uh, ancient times in Lebanon, uh, being used in uh, hospitals. Another comment is about, um, well, the pure aspect of music, if such a thing exists, perhaps that's a bit of a, uh, you could have a, a whole other uh, event or debating that, I suppose. Um, but it is a question, is there something, is there something about music that is not attached to any cultural uh, aspect? Um, so maybe if anyone wants to dive into that one. Uh, and some other really, really interesting uh, uh, comments talking about the ambivalence again of music. Uh, there's some comment. I invite you to read read some of those because uh, rather than me just reading them out, it's it's there for everyone to see. Um, and and also so there's some, some examples from India and also some examples about marching bands. All really good points. I'm just going to remind you all about some of the things that were brought up earlier. Henrika, who uh, unfortunately had to leave a little bit early, um, but she asked some questions about how well would this kind of approach to peace building work at a national level um, and also questions about inclusivity and alienation and perhaps uh, music would work better in some societies rather than others and uh, Jonathan uh, brought up uh, or sorry Jacob brought up um, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra uh, there's been a fair bit of research on that particular organization and its role in peace building and its effectiveness or not. Uh, again, that's something that maybe someone wants to pick up on. Again, a question of scaling up uh, and this idea of uh, nationalism and its relationship to the national anthems was an interesting one uh, as, as a way of creating an identity marker at a national level through music. Um, and then Paul, asked about uh, is there a material aspect of peace building that can be connected to music uh, or not. Uh, so I just wanted to summarize all the things that have been going on so far. Um, who, would anyone like to comment? Maybe Olivier, I don't know if you would like to respond to or comment on any any aspect of, of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, very briefly, we only have a few minutes uh, I'd like to say we need to keep in touch and to continue exchanging notes uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that musical events are uh, very localized and happen in the moment. So uh, it's very hard to generalize and, and not make mistakes. Um, for example, Enrica asked, uh, are there uh, times where maybe uh, music may not work uh, in peace building activities? Absolutely true. Sometimes after you interview people or ask them what they need to do, they want to do, you realize that, oh, wow, if you add music in that situation, it's going to backfire. So you don't, you don't touch it. So each um, situation is, is very different, very unique. And uh, ideally, you, you need you know, a whole team of people. You need uh, performers and singers, but you need also teachers. You need uh, workshop activists, uh, and then you need ethnographers, people who are able to really listen to people and what kind of music they would like and if they would like it. Uh, and so as a result, um, the best thing we can do, I think, is to um, collaborate together and, and let our resources be available um, open access if possible, so that people who are who come and have uh, they are in charge of a refugee camp or they are in charge of rebuilding the country or a, a neighborhood, um, instead of having to start from scratch and well, would music be available here or not, they could access um, a, a common website, for example, a common space where we would have uh, hundreds and hundreds of case studies and they could then see something that approaches their own situation. So that, that would be um, my, my hope for this really uh, fabulous um, uh, collective participation. And, and, and notice that if we, were, if we could have played music together, we wouldn't have to take turns. That's the problem with language. We have to take turns, it takes time. We could, we could have all played together at the same time. Um, so I, I, I leave it at that and, and really uh, thank everybody and let the next person uh, comment on some points. Thank you. 
thanks, Olivier. I'm going to open it up now. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question or, or comment? Okay, in that case, I'm just going to uh, go into some of the comments a bit in a bit more detail that have come up in the Q and A. Um, so there was one comment. Uh, again, there's a lot of comments uh, talking about the ambivalence or different examples in the same context about how music, on one hand, has brought people together uh, for a more positive purpose, and on the other hand, for a rather less positive purpose. Uh, the example in India that was uh, mentioned uh, where balladeers would often be arrested uh, by the state um, around with, with controversial and non-people friendly policies, as it's stated here. Uh, yet it's also been a way for the oppressed to raise their voices, uh, which is a really good point. Um, there was an earlier comment about how, well, it's one of those things, I guess, it's uh, if, if anyone wants to talk about this in any more detail, this idea that at the same time, music brings people together through a shared experience, but by bringing people together, you are simultaneously um, creating a boundary uh, between who is part of that and who isn't, and is that perhaps also the source of the conflict? And another question or sort of concept to think about, I thought of, really, is that is perhaps this nebulousness, this ambiguity, is this actually the strength of it? As Jonathan pointed out, it can operate under the radar uh, in ways that other forms of communication and bringing people together can't. Um, so just looking, I believe Laura would like to comment. Well, we've heard a lot of different approaches to the idea of music and peace building, social change, and people coming from very different um, sorts of uh, programs or studying different approaches. Um, I'm, I'd just like to comment about uh, organizations such as ours and um, and uh, Darren's and others who are actually working in conflict regions um, with the thought that um, I don't think there are any pat answers to these questions. I think that there are, um, there are principles of uh, listening, of responding, of, uh, of uh, responding to actually what is needed and de demand to co-creating um, projects or um, interventions together with people and not coming with our own kind of set ideas of what would work here or there. To me, that's, that's really um, essential in this, in this type of work. And, and it also means understanding that sometimes you're not gonna see the results that you're hoping for in the time period that you're hoping for, that it, you're really talking about uh, long-term connections and understanding that none of us is going to solve the problems of the world on our own. So being understanding all these different approaches and that they are all different threads in a larger fabric is extremely important. And yes, um, Mitrovic Rock School is, was not only an initiative of Musicians Without Borders, but is still very much in the center of our work along with a couple of other rock schools in the region now. And that's an example because we've been there since 2008. So it's, you know, it's really about sticking with the things you're doing, um, building relationships, uh, helping to um, allow spaces where agency can emerge from local people and then responding to that and supporting it as best and as humbly as possible. So um, that, those, are, that, those are just my thoughts on that particular strain. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Laura. And I believe Jacob wants to comment. Great, thanks, Craig. Um, yes, yeah, some, some really, really excellent questions and, and thoughts here. Right? I was struck by the, the, the question that, that Rajiv asks about um, the dialogue aspect of music as opposed to the healing aspect. And I'm not sure if this is what you had in mind, Rajiv, but I've always been struck by um, the extent to which these type of people-to-people -people activities um, address the actual substance of, of conflicts. And I've always wondered whether or not that is something that would be helpful or something that would be actively harmful um, in terms of trying to build these uh, alternative connection points through, you know, kind of say music identity. Um, so I don't, I don't particularly have an answer for you, uh, more just maybe to underscore that I think it's, it's an excellent question. Um, is the actual pursuit of music enough or are there different types of dialogue 
um, that potentially also need to be built into these type of activities in order to have uh, a larger, broader transformational um, effect? Or is that something that is actually going to put off participants from participating because part of the reason why you do it is to get away from that kind of political baggage, as it were. Um, really interesting example that Manjima raises from, from India as well about the balladeers. I think about this also in the context of the examples that have been raised, protest against the Vietnam War, for example, where folk music was a very strong aspect of, of, uh, of that protest. So I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that that, that can be significant. Um, it, the final thought about the, the issue of, of marching bands that was also raised. I imagine Darren probably has <laughs> a particular perspective on this from, uh, from, from Northern Ireland. And I think while it can obviously bring one community together, does it have the capacity to bring different communities together? And, and genuinely fascinated to hear, Darren, if this is something that you've seen, because we tend to always hear about the marching bands and the marching activities as something being uniquely negative. Yeah. Uh, but is there any type of, of uh, nexus that, that comes together with these type of uh, activities? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jacob. Yeah, Just Darren, we're gonna- quick, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. Yeah, yeah if, if you can manage to, to respond in one minute flat, then that'd be no, perfect. No problem. And yes, we've, we, yeah, we've been working with a lot of the marching bands over the years. And I mean, we're here in Northern Ireland and we're coming up to marching season. And it's, you know, with, with all the complexities of having no formal government in place at the minute and Brexit and all those things going on, and we're coming out of the pandemic, tensions are high anyway here. And, uh, you know, we're, we're worried about what's ahead. We're actually releasing a, a video from yesterday on Monday, which is members of marching bands from the Protestant Peony Protestant community and rock musicians, heavy metal musicians called Marching Metal. And already people are very excited about that from, from all sides of the community because rock fans want to see that. Uh, and for people who probably don't really engage with a lot of the, the marching bands, it's a way of accessing new audiences and getting those conversations going. Because at the end of the day, a lot of those bands are giving a lot of young people, especially young men, a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, teaching them music, teaching them how to look after themselves, and uh, it's a space for them uh, to bounce off each other when they need each other. So there's positives and there's, there's things we look at, but um, it's always about music, I say, always about music. Great. Thanks very much, Darren. And thank you to everybody uh, who's participated uh, today. It's been absolutely fascinating. I hope everyone's enjoyed it and, uh, and learned something. Uh, I certainly have. And uh, I hope that we can continue these conversations after this event on, on an ongoing basis. Um, so we, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Uh, you can check out the website for full details of all the events in the festival program. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue these conversations using the hashtag uh, York Ideas. Uh, the recording of this event uh, will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website after the 20th of June. And you will be contacted by email when this when the video is available to view. And thank you very much again to all the panelists and to Olivier uh, for the pre presentation. And uh, thank you all for viewing.